Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, grab your seats, grab some breakfast. Uh, but most importantly, welcome this morning to Terry Third Thursday. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. It's never been a problem before. Um, I'm Zach Deming. I am the Terry Third Thursday chair. But most importantly, I'm extremely pleased to be here this morning filling in for Dean Ayers, who is at Deer Run Plantation uh, for a retreat with the students and the former Coca-Cola CEO, Doug Ivester. Um, most importantly, welcome to Terry Third Thursday. It's so warming and refreshing to pull into the parking deck at 715, 720 and see this many cars. But with our speaker this morning, that is the last thing, that's the last surprise anybody should ever have. We're gonna have a great morning and really excited that we can all, we can all do this together. For those of you who perhaps are coming here for our first time, uh, welcome to Terry Third Thursday and welcome to the Teak as we call it. It's uh, the Terry Executive Education Center. This is our monthly breakfast event. This is our base operation here in Atlanta. Uh, this is where alumni, students come to network, uh, professional education programs, and a lot happens here, and we're glad to have you here in the facility. It takes a tremendous amount of effort to organize these events each and every month, uh, and for that I want to thank uh, the Terry Third Thursday Committee, uh, our alumni board, which is uh, about nine members, and most importantly, our sponsors. Uh, to that effect, we couldn't do any of this without our sponsors. Our primary corporate sponsor is Bank of North Georgia. If you'd please put your hands together and help me in thanking Bank of North Georgia. As well as our two media sponsors, uh, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and Public Broadcasting Atlanta, WABE. Thank you again to our media sponsors. Uh, just a couple of, kind of housekeeping notes and things to put on your calendar. Boy, it'd be great to see this every every third Thursday of every month. So I would encourage you to please pay attention uh, and come. We'd love to have you. Uh, next month on May 19th, we have Alex Taylor, who will be speaking with us. Alex is Executive Vice President of, uh, of Cox Enterprises. And then on June 16th, we have Mary Lashinger, Chairman of the Board and CEO of Veritiv, uh, both of which should be very exciting programs. I want to mention a couple of other important dates for Terry that we have coming up. On April 30 is our annual alumni awards and gala. Uh, would love to have you there. And May 13th is our Terry graduation ceremony. I'm relatively certain there's a number of people that have never attended one of those here. Um, on to our speaker, Beno Ansley III. Beno comes from a long line of UGA founders, professors, and graduates. His great-great-grandfather, Henry Lumpkin, co-founded the law school at UGA. Beno graduated from Terry in 1999 with a uh, bachelor's in real estate. Throughout his 15-year career as a real estate broker, developer, and investor, but no Ansley's company has made the Bulldog 100 three times, rankings number three, four, and 22, respectively. Built upon a foundation of marketing and branding, Bonneau's boutique firm specialized in luxury residential real estate. A proud Bulldog, Bonneau has the unique distinction of being named one of the top realtors in the country. He's brokered, over, deve brokered or developed over $1 billion in his career. And last year alone, he personally sold an impressive $170 million in residential real estate. He also owns a thriving construction company, and he's a partner in at least a dozen other businesses throughout the state. But he was regarded as one of the top real estate professionals in America by the Wall Street Journal. So if you would, please join me this morning in putting your hands together and welcome our speaker, uh, but no Ansley. Good morning, guys. Question to ask. Is the life you're living the same life that wants to live inside you? Think about that for a minute. Is the life you're living today the same life that you want to live? If you analyze a snapshot of my life from kindergarten through the end of high school, one conclusion would jump off the page. I wasn't going to be a nuclear scientist. I wasn't going to be an accountant. I wasn't going to be a doctor or lawyer. That just wasn't in the cards for me. I went to every school in Atlanta. <laughs> By seventh grade, I was already at boarding school. Uh, in fact, I spent most of my time in grade school selling, selling my teachers not to flunk me, selling my way out of trouble. I got so good, eventually, I started selling t-shirts in high school. I was a terrible, terrible student. Luckily, I love being around people 
and playing sports, so I, I never lost my, my confidence. I was a highly competitive kid. But I was born with dyslexia and ADD. I don't know if anybody in here has any of those things. I'm probably born with a bunch of other stuff, but those two are the biggest, dyslexia and ADD. My biggest challenge was just staying focused. School totally bored me. There's the biology, all chemistry, all these things. I just couldn't care less. Um, from a very young age, I was just really an unconventional thinker. I did things totally different than anybody else. You know, that my style completely clashed with the sit down, shut up, learn this subject. I made it out of high school by the skin of my teeth. I'm not sure how much formal education I got, but one thing's for sure, I graduated with 12 years of sales experience. When I started to search for colleges, luckily UGA was a perfect fit. It was the only place that accepted me. <laughs> Thank God for those seven generations before me. And what's ironic is when I was going to UGA, my sister was graduating from Harvard, summa cum laude, and on her way to Columbia. So there was a real difference there in education path. My first two years at UGA was spent at the fraternity house. And I started my first real business, I started my first real business as a freshman. I continued the theme of selling t-shirts and I started a silk screening t-shirt company. Very quickly, I was selling every, I was selling t-shirts to every fraternity and sorority for every one of their parties um, every year. When I, you know, made so much money, I was the only sophomore that had a ski boat, which was, which was really great. School was still very much on the back burner. I decided to major in real estate. By my third year, it was clear that that really fit me like a glove. The Terry College of Business is actually where the magic happened in school for me. My perspective on school was positively changed forever. There was a couple of um, uh, teachers, uh, Dr. Monarchy and Dr. Downs, I don't know if anybody had, had them in the Terry College of Business, but they were the real estate professors and they really changed the way that I thought about school. When we'd sit down in class, we would do case studies instead of just getting a whole bunch of information where we would have a piece of land and we'd have to figure out with that piece of land, how, what do we do with it? You know, what's the best, highest and best use? How do we hire an architect and a planner? Then how do we get it financed? How do we get it zoned? How do we then market it and sell it? So all these different pieces for my ADD really was great because there were so many different pieces of the puzzle. So finally that clicked. Um, I was naturally drawn to the challenge of juggling all those pieces. Being ADD it was really hard for me to focus, as I told you, but taking classes that I enjoyed really had the light bulb go off for me and I actually became hyper-focused. So when you're ADD, you're all over the place, but when you really want to do something, you can actually really hyper-focus on it. So that was really good for me. Um, I can't believe it, but I actually graduated Terry College of Business with a 3.7 GPA, which was just unbelievable. Um, I built my first house as a senior in college. I made $71,000, which was a ton of money, and I just loved it, and I had the bug, and I was going to be a real estate mogul, and I never, I never was going to look back. Over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to share how I followed three simple steps and built two of the leading residential real estate companies in Atlanta. One is a brokerage company and one is a construction company. I hope that you will hear at least one idea that you can immediately pass on in your life or in your business. Let me start off with the cliff note version of my story. As, as you will see, I never really order off the menu. Um, I have a hard time choosing the available options. I didn't take the conventional route when I graduated from, uh, from college. Everybody else went into commercial real estate or went into training programs or banking or went to New York. I packed my car and went down to Savannah, Georgia. I knew my skills and there weren't many of them, but I knew a couple skills and that was being with people. So I went and hounded this developer who was developing the Ford plantation down in Savannah, Georgia. Anybody ever been there, heard of that? So I was about 21 years old and I looked like I was 16. And I said, you know, Mr. Developer, please hire me. You don't have to pay me anything. You know, only pay me if I sell something, sell a lot, it's commission based. So he took a chance on me and hired me. After a year, I sold $20 million worth of lots as a 21-year-old, which was great. I outsold all the other guys that had been there for five and 10 years, and I really kind of, I loved it. I learned how to you know, take somebody that was going down I-95 to Florida to go buy a piece of property. They'd see our billboard, and they'd pop in. And I'd, have, I'd usually have about four hours to sell them. I'd get them in my car, 
I'd have to sell them a dream of what they could build on this lot and then how they were going to be a better golfer and how they were going to learn how to fish and, you know, selling the dream. And I was really good at selling this dream. And uh, I'd have to get people to sign the contract before they got in their car and, and drove down to Florida. And I also had to make sure they didn't get bit by any mosquitoes while they were there. Um, so I did that, and I loved it. Every time I'd sell a lot, I'd, inter I'd actually introduce them to a builder to go build their dream house on their lot. And this guy was making all this big money building these houses for them on the lots that I would sell. About this time, there was a development that was on the horizon called Palmetto Bluff in South Carolina. It was 22,000 acre, beautiful development, um, high and dry marina, Jack Nicholas golf course right on the May River. And they had this plan of the beautiful Auberge Hotel. I went in there, this time I was about 24 years old, and I um, luckily got a meeting with the head developers, and I said, hey, look, I wanna be able with my builder, we formed a company, which we hadn't at that time, but we formed a company, and we wanna buy all this property around this proposed hotel. Luckily, I don't know how we did it, but we structured a way to buy it without putting a whole bunch of money down, and we built over $100 million worth of homes in about five years which was incredible. The market was absolutely on fire. We uh, had partnered with some great architects to have a, a phenomenal plan. We built some really, really great looking houses and they were just selling like crazy. So we sold $100 million worth of property. Things were just couldn't be better. Um, my wife and I, who I met in Georgia my freshman year, we built our dream house right on the Savannah River and we were uh, pregnant with our first child and life just couldn't be better. We were on a high. And then at dinner, we were, uh, we were at dinner one night and our house got struck by lightning. It, it burned all the way to the ground. You know, we were three or four weeks away from having our first kid. Um, we had just built this. It took a couple years to build the house and the planning. Had all of our furniture, all of our college pictures, everything that we owned. We're sitting there, and it was a, it was a low point, um, and we had to uh, figure out kind of what our next chapter was. And we didn't sit around and, 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 and cry too long. We, we made a conscious decision to, 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 to reset, and we moved to Atlanta, Georgia. We had a baby, a um, beautiful baby named Blakely, and we, uh, I met some guys at Carter, and we had a vision to build some townhomes. So we wanted to build these townhomes and have them the best thing that Atlanta's ever seen. So we hired the best architect, the best contractor. We had the best piece of property right on Peachtree Road, south of St. Phillips, north of Peachtree Battle. These townhomes were gonna be for $2.5 million all the way to $4.5 million. We had the Southern Accent show home there. It was absolutely phenomenal. Problem was, we finished it in 2008. So if you remember that time, 2008 was a tough year. Lehman fell, real estate market spiraled, and I'm sitting there with this great piece of property. We had about three quarters of them spoken for, but nobody came to the closing. So more time went by, more time went by, and we ended up losing the property to the bank. Another low, low moment. At that time, I'd probably lost about 75% of my net worth from everything that I've done from college till now. I'm sitting there in 2008, not making a dime. We had another baby. We had just built another big house in Atlanta, and I wasn't making any money. My ego was totally shot again, and I didn't know what to do. So at that time, you got to dust the pride off of your shoulders and go ahead and try to reinvent yourself. So that's what I did. I didn't sit idle too long because I'm kind of a spaz and I just can't sit idle. And um, I went over to the bank and I said, hey, nobody knows this project better than me. I spent three years building it. I was here every day. I know every nook and cranny of this, uh, of this building. Let me sell it to you. Let me sell it for you. Again, I was listening back to my life and I kind of went back to where I was, where I had the most fun, where I had the most success, and that was being with people, selling the dream, uh, selling them a piece of property. So I went back to the bank and said, I'm gonna sell these for you. They hired me, and I ended up, 2009, selling them. 
I still kind of had one foot in as a developer, one foot in as a sales guy, because being a developer just seemed cooler to me. Um, there was a lot of real estate agents out there. But I put two feet in to be a real estate agent. I ended up selling all the Regents Park townhomes. And then after I'd sell a townhome, the guy would say, hey, well, why don't you go sell my, my house? Well, I'm not really set up for that, but I'll, I'll go try to do that. My first year uh, as an agent was 2009. I ended up being the number one agent in Atlanta uh, per the Atlanta Board of Realtors. So I started strong, even though that was a down year um, for, uh, for, for residential real estate, but I ended up number one. And from there, I ended up saying, I'm gonna be a real estate agent. So I, I, I started with Harry Norman Realtors, and every time I'd get so busy that I couldn't handle it, I'd hire somebody. First hired Hill Harper from UGA, great, done an amazing job, still with me running, running the show. And then I'd hire somebody else, and then I'd hire somebody else, and then I'd hire somebody else. Last year, I sold 170 million uh, with, my, with my group. And if you add up my five closest competitors, then they get to, to kind of the number that we're selling. So we're doing something right. We outwork everybody and we've got a really good uh, platform to sell real estate. We got so good that we left Harry Norman, bought a building on the Beltline and started our own business. It's called Ansley Atlanta Real Estate. And, um, and that's, where we, that's where we are today. We've just hired a, a, a broker, a guy that started the condo store, and he's gonna uh, focus on running our business as broker and president, which lets me sell, because that's what I'm best at. You know, if I, again, listen to my life, where am I most happy? Where does my skill set is the strongest? And that's out being in front of people, probably not running, running a business, but I can think about the business, but I wanna have somebody else start it. Since graduating, Terry, as you can see, I've had a lot of twists and turns and reinventions. No matter what I did, I always listened to my life. You know, if you, if you ask me to bottom line my success, it really comes down to three things. Discover your uniqueness. Create a reputable brand. And then leverage the hell out of that brand that you created. I define uniqueness, really, by the marriage of your passion and your skills. The key to being unique is to find the one thing that you do better than anybody else. If you, if you chase two rabbits, you will not catch either one. Think about that. If you chase two rabbits, you will not catch either one. So focus on one. Focus on your one thing and do it better than anybody else. Again, as you all know, I don't have many skills, right? I, but I am good at being with people and trying to sell them a vision. I sold my wife to marry me. I mean, I've done a lot of selling. I've done a lot of selling through my life, and that's all I got. So I put myself in a position to be successful, you know. Um, I didn't pick my one thing to be a professional golfer, you know, even though I'd like to do that, but I don't have the strength, the size, whatever, the natural skill to be successful in that. So choose something that marriages your skills to set yourself up for success. I think that's highly important. There's two problems with uniqueness. People don't trust themselves to be authentic. Just because your dad's a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant doesn't mean that you have to be that profession. Does that work with your natural skill set? I don't know. But to be successful, it needs to be. So be authentic and choose the path that makes it work for your skill set. If you're a great motivator and you love sports and you love teaching kids, go be a coach. That's where you're gonna have your highest success. Look at Kirby Smart. You know, he's at the top of his pinnacle as a coach. Also know what you're not good at. Don't try to hide your weaknesses. I got more weaknesses than anybody in this room. But I know what they are. I was at a listing appointment several years ago and I was going to list this guy's house, and I went through my listing appointment, and I do everything that I do, tell him how great I am, and I can sell my, the house faster than anybody. And he called me and said, hey, you know, come have lunch with me tomorrow. I said, all right, that's kind of weird. You know, I usually just go ahead and get, get it signed up. Why do I got to have lunch with this guy? But I'll, I'll, go, I'll go have lunch with him. <laughs> so I ended up going to have lunch with him. He said, hey, you know, you did really great in your listing presentation, but 
you you missed one whole quadrant of my brain. I'm like, what, what's this guy talking about? You know, he asked me what his house was worth, and I said, your house is worth eight hundred thousand dollars. And he said, why? I go, well, just because it is. You know, I know what every house is worth in this neighborhood, and your house is worth eight hundred grand. So that's what it is. You know, trust me. He didn't want to trust me. He has an analytical brain, and if you look at this thing here on the on the left side of your brain, there's logical, analytical, quantitative. I don't have any of that <laughs> at all. <laughs> so know your weaknesses, and he showed me what my weakness was. He ended up signing a, a contract with me, but from there on out, I became a better listing agent because now I had a completed listing presentation where I'd hit somebody's emotion, I'd hit somebody that they could trust me, and then I backed it up with a bunch of data that I get Hill to do for me um, <laughs> that shows about square footage and, and, and what it's worth and why it's worth this and all this other stuff, and, um, and that, that's what really makes it, makes it better. So know your weaknesses. I think that's really important. And then backfill your weaknesses with really qualified people who are very, very strong in those places. I've done that a lot. Um, once you identify your uniqueness, your passion, what you're going to be good at, then you got to kind of use it. You got to go and make a brand. You got to go share the brand with, with the world and go do it better than anybody. In 2010, after I took over the sales over at Regents Park and started selling, I literally became my brand. And I know my friends know that, but I did everything but get a tattoo on my forehead that says, I sell real estate. I wanted everybody in the world to know that I sold real estate. I also wanted to know that I was really good at it. So I hired PR people. I'm always in the magazine and stuff because you got to put it out there if you're going to do it. So go all in with whatever you're going to do or you're not going to be successful. I brand everything. <laughs> I give hats away. I give shirts away, balls, anything you name it. It's got Anzi Atlanta on. It's all over town, hopefully. Um, so I brand everything. Once you decide on your brand, you got to find the right name and image and start planting those seeds. So my seeds are my real estate signs. Uh, I plant these seeds, uh, I plant these signs everywhere, and, I, and they're always hopefully usually in front of really expensive houses. Um, that makes my signs with luxury, you know? Um, and being, being in front of these beautiful houses makes other people want to have their sign or my sign in front of their houses. It's kind of like gravity. And then when you have companies moving to town, Home Depot, Invesco, they want to work with somebody that specializes in the high-end market. So I've set myself up to, to, to have this luxury market. A couple of times we use our brand and pair it with other brands, just like I had a $5 million house a couple of weeks ago. And, oh, let's go back to that one. Y'all know who those people are? Uh, Nini Leaks, I think your name is. Um, Housewives of Atlanta, I'm on TV every now and then selling them, <laughs> selling them property. It's somewhat embarrassing, but it's somewhat fun because it gets, it gets the brand out there that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm showing up, I'm selling, and, and, and I'm the guy on TV selling, selling them property. So that, that is fun. Okay, next, please. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I paired with Ferrari of Atlanta, a, a really, really great, brand is Ferrari. It, that just, just smells luxury, right? So I had this $5 million house, and I wanted to make a splash with this new listing. So I had Ferrari of Atlanta come out and bring all these new Ferraris, um, and we had my clients and their clients, and I invited this surgeon group out of Piedmont to come over and test drive these Ferraris. It's pretty cool because you know if, they're, if you're on the Ferrari list or on the surgeon list, you've got money to maybe buy a big house. So they were test driving these Ferraris, and then we had refreshments inside so they would stumble into the house and be able to see this house, and we got some good interest on it. We did the same thing on Derek Lowe's house. Y'all remember Derek Lowe, who's a great pitcher for the Braves? Well, one of the best things that ever happened to me is he got traded because I got, I, I, got I got to list his house, and he got traded really quickly. So we took all of his furniture out of the house. I'm going, God, how am I going to sell this house for $3.5 million without any furniture? So I called an art gallery, and we put a couple million dollars worth of art in the Bacon House. We invited all their clients who bought art over $10,000, all my high-end high clients, and anybody else I could think of that was rich. And we had an art party. Somebody that came from their list to look at art 
stumbled into the house and bought the house. They weren't even in the market for it. So pairing your brand with other luxury brands, you never know what's going to happen. Um, my point is, if you put the time and effort into building your brand and fully immerse yourself into that brand, unbelievable opportunities will follow. As I can tell you, I strongly believe in the purpose of creating a strong brand. But you got to leverage it. You got to just leverage it like crazy. Don't have blinders on. I don't have blinders on when I go, wake up in the morning and say, I'm just going to sell houses today, sell houses, sell houses, sell houses, like a, like a horse running down the track. Take those blinders off because you never know how you're going to be able to pair your brand to do other things. One thing we did a year ago or so is um, we partnered and started a company to build houses. You know, if I'm selling 200 houses a year, at least half of those people have a construction need. So I was just giving that to other builders. So I went to the 800-pound gorilla in town, a guy named Monty Hewitt, who's got a great reputation, builds about 100 houses a year, and we started a home building company. He didn't build any custom homes. He's always doing lifestyle developments. So we paired my brand with his brand and created Ansley Hewitt Custom Homes. This year, we'll probably do $25 million worth of construction volume, which is, which is pretty good for a year-old company. We should be able to grow that to do 40 or 50 million over the next few years a year. And, um, and we symbolize building high-end luxury homes, and that's been a great thing. But you can't stop there. You know, uh, I get to sell a lot of expensive houses, and I really get to meet people that I wouldn't know otherwise. And I always ask them, you know, God, how, what's your uniqueness? You know, what's, what's your deal? How, how, did you, how are you buying this $3 million house? And I get, uh, I get their story, and, and over the last five years, I've invested in dozens of my clients' ventures. I'm in bowling alleys. I'm in men's clothing stores. I'm in HVAC companies. I'm in a company called Rody. I've even been an executive producer for a surfing documentary, which I don't recommend. <laughs> um, one of my favorite in investments is a company called Rubicon Global, and I've got some friends and clients that started that company there. Rubicon used technology to change the waste and recycling business, the same way that Uber changed the taxicab industry. If you take an old business model and inject technology into it, it makes it dramatically better. I was lucky to put the seed money in that company you know, when it was valued at about $10 million, now that company's worth over $500 million. Take an old business model, invest technology on it, and see what happens, right? We plan to do the same thing with the Ansley Atlanta brand. Use technology to change the real estate industry. People right now just have nice, pretty websites. They put a sign in the yard. They wait for the phone to ring. With the way that technology is moving and changing, on a yearly basis, whatever company you have, you've got to have the latest and greatest technology or you're just going to, you're not going to be around or you're not going to be relevant. Use technology. Love to talk to you guys about um, any questions you have about the Atlanta market, where we are with the residential market. Atlanta is a great city uh, to buy a house in, to sell a house in. It's uh, got a great uh, cost of living. Jeez, I mean, our Million dollar houses here would be $10 million houses in a lot of other markets. Um, the market is back from where we were in 2008 um, when we finished that Regents Park project. It's back and it's strong and things are selling quicker than they ever have. Um, it's, uh, it's, been, it's, it's been a real treat to be selling real estate the last several years. I'd love to answer anybody's questions they have um, on anything. So I um, appreciate y'all listening to me. Hey, Bino, you were president of SAE when you were a student at UGA. What kind of experience from leadership would you take from that experience? <laughs> That's a great question, Palmer. Thank you. Um, that was a balance between trying to be cool and then trying to not get kicked off campus. 
Um, that was great. You know that you, you have to um, make sure that, that that everybody's doing the right thing, and and also keep a reputation with the, with the fraternity. And um, that was a great thing. That was a great thing that that, that I did. And I was fortunate enough to uh, to be elected to do that. Um, I also loved that because I got to stay involved and actually become very good friends with the younger the younger grades that were coming through the freshmen and the sophomores. Um, and some some seniors, you know, just kind of didn't know those guys, and I got to know them, and I still sell them houses and are friends with them now. So that was that was a great thing for me. Hey, good morning. Uh, you mentioned just a minute ago that real estate values are kind of back to their pre two thousand eight levels, and that everyone oddly seems to be a little bit nervous about that. Is there something that's different about today's market than perhaps what it was previously? Is it the underwriting standards that have kind of helped support the market, or you know, kind of where, where are we today? The market's really, really good. So that makes people think, are we in another bubble? Are we about to go back down? The answer is no. The reason why is 2008, 2009, 2010, even a little bit of 2011, nobody was buying any real estate. So right now, there's a pent-up demand. All those people during that time, their families grow, grew. You know, they need a bigger house. Um, you know, they, they're making more money now. There is a pent-up demand for people to buy houses now. There's more buyers than there are houses. Atlanta, on a micro level, is just getting better and better. Companies are moving in here. This is a uh, big-time companies are moving in here, and there's more people coming in. So from an Atlanta standpoint, I don't see a slowdown in our market at all. I still think it's going to go up. It's not going to go up like this, like it was. Now we're like this, which is still really, really good. So for the people that are waiting for the market to go back down before they buy a house, I think you're going to be waiting a long time. I've been a thing. Um, First of all, stay out of commercial real estate. We'll be good. I'm glad you're <laughs> in residential real estate after that story. Um, but, you know, it's ironic after Savannah, you come back to Atlanta, and part of Atlanta's past is it was essentially burnt down and rebuilt back up. And it sounds, you know, very similar to kind of what you went through with your career, hitting almost the bottom and then coming back up to where you are. And I think you glanced over it a little too quickly when there are probably a lot of great lessons that could be learned from it and things that maybe you brought from the past, you know, out of the ashes, brought back up um, with you here. And if you could go through some of those, I think it'd be very um, interesting to hear. And then if you can also maybe elaborate with all the businesses you got going on, like how do you decide which duty that you're going to do first with all that going on to really enhance your life? Yeah, thanks, Scott. That's that's a great question. Um, you kind of always got to start with the duty that lies near. You know, is that your family? Is that is that is that your, it's usually your family, but your family, your business, uh, your religion, whatever that is. But do your duty that lies the nearest. Um, and, and and from that, you know, we touched on, um, you know, the the crash in 08. And there's probably a lot of real estate guys in here. That was a really tough tough time. And I I could have. Uh, had my whole speech talk about that crash and 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 what where wh what some people did with with that losing money and losing careers and losing you know or what some other people did um, and and luckily you know you just can't go hide in a corner you know you've got to you got to get up and you got to go do something I did I mean I had <laughs> kids and big houses and I had stuff to pay for and I wasn't making any money so I had to reinvent myself and I had to you know Take a take an ego bath. I mean, you know, get get start from the bottom as just an individual agent, just one guy trying to get a listing to sell a house. So um, it's a tough time, but uh, but but I learned a lot, and that made me a lot better of who I am today. Hi, I really enjoyed this presentation, and I definitely understand your concept about doing the one thing and focusing on one thing. And I noticed that with the name of your company, Ansley Atlanta, it seems like you've kind of focused your efforts on Atlanta, but do you see that you're gonna eventually go maybe outside <coughs> of Atlanta with your business, maybe out to North Atlanta, 
or you know, just kind of expand it. Because I do like your concept too, as far as technology. I think the old model of real estate is changing and it's kind of going away. And it's good to see that you're kind of up to date on that. So, do you see that you're going to eventually go outside of Atlanta with your business, or are you just going to focus mostly on on this in town market? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, you know, our, our, our 24 month goal is to uh, be a continual leader in the Atlanta market by selling about a billion dollars a year uh, f from the brokerage side. But our motto is we want to be a one stop shop for our clients. That's why we brought in the construction side. And there might be some other sides we'll bring in as it relates to that. But we also want to go where our clients go. So, uh, you know, I, I can see in the future for us having a Ansley Coastal, uh, an Ansley Mountain, um, Ansley Savannah. Um, we've got some stuff in the works as it relates to that. And the home building company will follow in those places as well. Because as the brokerage company grows, of course, the construction company will follow. So thank you. So I'm curious. You you said earlier ADD and uh, what was the other uh, dyslexia? We can we can we can have a lot of them, but dyslexia. Right. You've got, you've we'll, got you, we'll use that one. You got a lot of letters. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what you're good at. You know what you're not good at. You partner with people that are good at what you are not good at. How do you keep from driving them crazy? Quite frankly, how do I keep from driving my partners crazy? Yes, <laughs> or your wife. If well. You you know, they signed on for, for it. Um, but, you know, if you partner with really good people, and again, I'm a salesman, so luckily I'm able to bring in like the David Tufts, who's had a tremendous career as a brokerage. I'm able to bring in Monty Hewitt. I'm married to, you know, uh, I'm able to marry pretty women, you know, once, and I just have one wife. Uh, I've only been married once. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how I keep them from not being crazy. I just, I, you know, maybe, who knows? But, uh, well, how, do they, how, do, how do they keep you, how do you keep, how do you keep them from driving you crazy? Oh, um, you know, we, we have very, we, uh, goal setting's huge. Uh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the biggest goal setter that, that anybody, I mean, I, I goal set every morning. Short term, I do long term goal setting and I do really long term goal setting. Um, if you don't have anything to keep accountable, um, I, I don't know how how anybody does any business without goal setting. But I think goal setting is one of the premier things that you can do to get from here to here and do it in small pieces. Um, so that that's what we do, and we do that with every business that we have. So guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate it and um, hope everybody had a good morning. Well, no, don't wander too far. We've, we've got something for you, but I wanted to be able to give you the appropriate introduction of what it is. It's now gotten sorted in the paper. Um, I've done enough of these that I should absolutely know this artist by name. and it. Loretta Eby, yes, perfect. Uh, Loretta Eby does these for us. We'd like to present one to you. It means the world to me, to Terry, and probably to everybody in the room that you would come and share your story with us. It's, uh, it's just as advertised, perhaps more impressive once you really hear it told. Thanks for spending time with us, and uh, it's an honor to have you. Thanks so much, Zach. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. So everyone, this concludes our, uh, our presentation this morning. I look forward to seeing all of you in 30 days. Uh, for Alex Taylor, uh, please be our guest again. We have parking validated for you uh, here as you go out. We enjoyed having you this morning. Be safe. Have a wonderful day to you and your families. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.